known Erica and the work of her organization for four years, neither of us would like to, uh, to mention. Uh, and the Kennedy Committee was very deliberate in choosing Erica to kind of um, tie together so many of the different themes and topics that uh, you know, we've explored the, the, the last day and a half. And I think uh, uh, you'll, you'll find uh, uh, her remarks uh, you know, enlightening and, and uh, uh, food for the, the, the soul as well as mine. So if you permit me, I'm going to just go ahead and read her formal introduction. Erica is the Chicago National Projects Director for Growing Power and is headquartered in Chicago, Illinois. As the daughter of Will Allen, she has a small farm agricultural background and experience. She spent her formative years involved in all aspects of farm management, from transplanting seedlings to managing farm teams and farmers' markets. Ms. Ms. Allen received her BFA from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and an MA in Art Therapy from the University of Illinois at Chicago. Years of experience working in urban communities with art education and social service brought her full circle back to her farming roots. Integrating the creative and therapeutic techniques of food security and community development has enabled Ms. Allen to establish nine urban agriculture and food system projects in Chicago. Her specialties include project planning, community food system design, and direct marketing training. Eric has provided technical assistance and planning support for thousands of new and limited resource farmers and local food pioneers to strengthen farm businesses. She actively works to create healthy and diverse food options in inner urban city and rural communities. Ms. Allen was an awardee to the Chicago Tribune Good Eating Award in 2006 and was honored by Family Focus in 2007 for her work in community food systems. In 2009, the Women's Environmental Institute won America as a mother of the environment. She's also a post Carbon Institute fellow. She served on the Illinois Food, Farms, and Jobs Act Council appointed by the government of Illinois and also served on the Chicago Mayor Ronald Manuel's transition team in the area of energy, environment, and public space. Erica was appointed as a board commissioner for the Chicago Park District in September 2000. Would you please join me in giving uh, our capstone speaker, Eric Allen, a warm welcome. Thank you so much. Can you all hear me okay? Yes. Kind of abstract sound system. So um, I have quite a few slides, the way that, um, that we tell our story is through images. You know, I mean, I think that you all have had a lot of conversation over the last day and a half, and I really want to tell our story um, based on um, the things that we've accomplished and hopefully give us a little bit of time um, for some questions and you know any kind of feedback that you may want to give me. So everything that we do starts with the soil. So I think you know one of the things I can say to you all as designers and thinkers and academics and hopefully some farmers, um, if you don't have a soil piece figured out, um, you can't really have an active and uh, sustainable food system. So um, I think this is really important as you begin to think about some of the projects that you're involved in here locally to not kind of um, put compost or thinking about how you're creating fertility sort of as at the back burner or something you're going to figure out down the road. We cannot do anything that, that we do without this. I, I can't grow. I, for 10 years, I've been able to develop projects in Chicago because I've been able to borrow on the fertility that we have in Milwaukee because there was nothing like that in Chicago. So just the importance of having this to be able to have these robust, you know, fecund projects with just tons and tons of production. You can't have that with, you know, uh, rural farm soil that you bring in. That's just not possible. So just, just for that to be clear. And also for me, and I, and I think for me on a personal level and something that, is, that you know, has always driven me as an artist and an, as an art therapist and then as part of our organization's backbone is really thinking about race and racism and how that impacts the food system. So, you know, some of the things that, and I'll talk really specifically later about um, GFGI, which is an initiative that we created specifically for folks working in the food system to have a space to talk about racism and privilege and how it impacts our work um, and to be able to really get reinforced to be able to do that. Because it's really hard to be in a space like this or within a community and have the power be so unequally spread out. You know, and then we're talking about creating sustainable food systems. You can't really do that without addressing these under, undercurrent issues. And it's in a place like Chicago, such a polarized city, that um, you have to. You have to address it and, and, and begin to challenge the, the, sort of the, the framework that has set up these, these kinds of inequities. So this is our vision. And you know, some of the key words, you know, sustainable food systems, equitable, ecologically sound, 
you know, to create justice. So it's not like, oh, la da da, let's talk about racism, let's all have a nice diverse melting pot scenario going on and then we've, we have it in, in a nice garden space, we're done. It's really about how we use those spaces to transform and create equity. And doing that in a way that we're not trying to dismantle racism within the food system, but using the food system as a tool to dismantle racism. I think that's really important to understand as well. So we're national, international. Um, we're a nonprofit, and you know, we're, I think we're kind of an unusual non non nonprofit because we generate about 60% of our um, operating budget from our own efforts. So our sustainability is, is just not just you know, lip service, it's really part and parcel of how we operate. You know, if we're training a farmer, trying to convince a farmer to transition from a conventional operation to growing year round in high tunnels and you know, take on this local food, food economy, you know, they have to know that they can cash flow. You know, they have to know that they can make a viable income. And so at, for, from the perspective of an organization that is you know, pioneered and researched a lot of these things for our own, our own work, we have, we have to do the economic piece as well. So, you know, when we talk about food systems, and, and you all have been talking about this, we're talking about high quality, safe, healthy, affordable, and culturally appropriate food for everybody in the community. So, you know, some people have issues with food deserts, that techno the terminology, I do not. I think it's been really helpful to help people begin to think about the disparities within our communities. And food is just such an easy way to see it because everybody eats. And when you go into a community and you don't see a grocery store, but you see lots of liquor stores, and there's high crime and, and low employment, and you go to another community, and it's the opposite, and then you look at the, the racial demographics of those communities, and you, know, you, be, you, you begin to really see some stark differences. So I tend to, and I encourage everybody, to not get so caught up in the semantics of the words, but really to use it as a tool, because I think a lot of people that it was kind of groundbreaking. They'd never thought of it before. They never thought of, you know, we know we have poor people living in ghettos or the inner city, but never thought of, you know, it being so contextualized around food. So I think that that's, I, I've, I've really um, found it to be a real helpful tool in breaking right through to the issues. So kind of pre-food food hub, we've been doing this thing called a community food center for 25 years. And a community food center is really just a centralized place where folks are growing, learning how to process, learning how to distribute, and consuming local food. These are our areas that we work. And, you know, and I think it's important, I mean, community food system work, when it's done fully, is so complex. It's, not, it's so many different pieces. You have to, like, there was a couple folks this morning that had these massive mind maps up, <laughs> and they kind of were apologetic about how complicated they they are, but that's, that's what it looks like. Because we're talking about something that we do three times a day, and that it, it, it's part of our whole lives are really revolved around our eating habits and how we interact and where we, where we get our food from and all the logistics and economies related to that. So these, these four areas are really essential in being able to move forward. So what, what do I mean by sustainable? And I think this is an important thing to also define. What do you mean by sustainable? It sounds real sexy, sustainable. Well, for, for us, it means growing soil. So being able to take all this food waste that is just st straight off from trucks, you know, old produce from, from the wholesale that had gone into the, into the um, landfill, we just take it, make a big pile, and that's the beginning of our compost operation. Um, my dad, um, I mean, that's, it's like, it's like the most, the, probably the, you know, that doesn't seem like a lot of fun. <laughs> Big pile <laughs> of food waste, you know, a nice bucolic barn in the background, and a big nasty pile of, of food waste. And this is in a residential community. But this is, this is what it's all about. This is what food justice is about. It's not about um, having a pretty rooftop garden where you have big dinner parties. That's not food justice. The food justice is being able to create living economies where folks are able to eat day in, day out, that they know where their food's coming from, where there's employment that's consistent, that people are getting paid a living wage, that nobody's being exploited, and that as many people in the community are involved and literate about this stuff. <coughs> so he purchased the facility that we're headquartered in Milwaukee in 1993. That's my son, Milwaukee, my dad. 
And he really bought it as a, um, a space for him himself as a farmer. He was transitioning from a corporate life, and he wanted a space that he who grow plant starts and, um, and distribute food. So he started doing that, and pretty, pretty soon teams started showing up. Um, Heifer Project showed up and wanted to fund our work um, based on actually a little aquaponic system that was developed uh, by folks up in Canada with our um, partners, FoodShare. So now food share folks in the house, so you know we have a, a robust relationship with them, and they're kind of our um, Canadian counterparts. And really began this this whole kind of infrastructure of figuring out the food system puzzle by having this root of, of compost and being able to work with teams and being able to distribute food in a way that was consistent and, and essentially controlled by the community. So the space, the actual, the, like the, the core of the facility on Silver Spring is really a living laboratory. It's a museum. It has, you know, um, aquaponic systems that are over 15, 20 years old that have been consistently in operation. Um, there's uh, tropical trees and plants and things from immigrant um, communities that are, are part of our, our staff and, and work, medicinal plants, all these different things happening. So when people come, regardless of their literacy, regardless, regardless of their culture, they're able to see it and connect with it. You know, from the duct tape to like, you know, simple technologies, I mean, it is not a fancy operation. But the, the concepts are incredibly sophisticated and really pretty ancient. So being able to take that information, translate that into an urban environment that has applications that are global. So a lot of our visitors are from other parts of the world, and they see the, the systems, and they get it. They're like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, that's, that's how we used to do this stuff. And the fertility piece really, really being underscored, because our aquaponic systems cannot operate without our compost and our vermicompost. Everything is, is anchored in, in that, that biomass and, and, and within that, that biology. This is a group of farmers from Uganda and Kenya. And it was amazing. Like, they came over for six weeks, and interned and spent time at our facility, went back and were able to replicate um, a lot of the systems that they learned about. And so just that simple kind of translation, you know, that I'm sure 20 years ago would have been like a multi-million dollar USA AID, you know, grant that nothing would have come to because it would have been very technologically um, burdensome and not, not possible for the farmers to replicate. So our um, operation, um, is pretty massive in Milwaukee. And these are some of the statistics. It gives you an idea of the sort of footprint. We're in a residential area, and that parking lot, oh, here I can use this, this little area here, we share the fence line with the Army Res Reserve Base, which is a really unique um, footprint. And right over here, this is when this was still under construction, is a new um, public housing mixed income community that we also operate, I think I might have a slide of it, we operate a community garden and are going to be operating a compost pickup and also possibly a grocery store. And it's a, um, a, a lead platinum community development. There's a really beautiful um, uh, you know, community design and they've thought very heavily about integrating food system and, and waste recovery. So you can see the, hoop, the greenhouses, and that, you know, this was part of, um, once upon a time, um, it was called um, a nursery row. So this is where all the, like, greenhouses and hot houses were um, for southeast Wisconsin. And um, this is the last remaining one that's still in operation. Those houses are gone now. Um, and I'll show you um, some images in a, in a minute about the vertical farm that we're going to be putting up in the next um, few years. Fifth Avenue Farm is um, a partnership we, ha we have with the Milwaukee um, Metropolitan Water and Sewage District. So it's land that has to stay open. And it's about five acres, and it is now, this is actually an older picture, it is covered with hoop houses. I think there's like 50, 96 foot long hoop houses in this space. And it really gives you an idea of like, with this technology, we, we figured out, there's a, a farmer in um, Mount Bayou, Mississippi, who designed a um, jig to bend just typical um, fence top rail, like from, you know, if you're, you're a chain link fence, you can get at Home Depot or wherever, and bend, to be able to bend the pipe 
to be able to build hoop houses. Because a PVC is not a good, that's not a good thing to use in anywhere where there's sunlight. Because <laughs> it's designed to be inside plumbing. It's not designed to deal with ultraviolet rays. So, um, you know, to be able to, to get material that's locally sourced, be able to build hoop houses has tremendous economic um, you know, potential for the communities we work, work with and also for ourselves. So hoop after hoop after hoop after hoop um, has been um, constructed on this site and it allows us to grow food year round. So right now there's kale, there's spinach, there's um, Swiss chard, uh, onions, you know, just enough food that we're able to grow um, throughout the winter season. And these are all unheated. So all of our hoop houses are unheated. There's a couple at our Silver Spring facility that do have heat and they have, and they have heat because of the aquaponic systems. But we're transitioning um, away from those, the heated systems, the ambient heated systems because we're shifting into yellow perch. So yellow, yellow perch are indigenous to the Great Lakes. Tilapia clearly are not. They're from the Nile and all over the world. Um, but they require you to heat the water. So, um, so we're moving away from that through a partnership we have with the um, University of Milwaukee Water Institute. So this is, this is actually a compost operation that we no longer have, but has helped us really scale up our compost. Um, composting, it, there's a lot of challenges with working with it was Veolia, like manage the site, and there's some racism involved, and blah, 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 blah. Now we have a partnership with a, um, with a, a landscaper that um, we work with to process all of our compost. We also do rural production. So this is um, about 40 acres um, um, outside of um, Milwaukee and Merton. So I, I mentioned a little bit. So I, I, you know, and I include these images to, to kind of give you an idea that when we talk about a community food system, we are not just talking about urban ag. So when you think about growing power, we're not just talking about you know, these cool urban systems that you know, have all these bells and whistles that look really great. They're essential. They're really important. And they create food security. And truly, in the context of if there was a disaster, where would you get your food from? I mean, that's kind of, that's my thinking a lot. What would, it, what would happen to, with the communities that I work with and I'm part of if there was a disaster and no food could come in? And thinking about it in that way changes a lot of the dynamics of how we think about economics. So to have a system where you have natural water filtration happening, because the systems do naturally filter water, you have protein being grown, you have the ability to go offline and not be using energy, that you have all those pieces, you have people who know how to, to perpetually create fertility, all those things are in place. So that is like a baseline. To me, that is food security. That's emergency, that's an, that's an emergency um, crisis management. And then when you scale out, you have to be able to have rural land. You know, we're in the Midwest. We get to use that rural land to grow food. <laughs> we should be doing that, you know? I. I I have no interest in growing food on a roof. I'm sorry. I think it's, you know, if you live in Brooklyn, yeah, but that's really hard to do. It's really expensive and, you know, but I think for, from a food security perspective, it makes a lot of sense. I want to grow my food in the earth. You know, that is, that is ideal. And I want to have a connection between urban production and rural production. So we're doing that. You know, we, you know, we don't have hoop houses out. Clearly, it, makes, it would make no sense to put hoop houses away from the city. Because I have to harvest those greens every day. So I have that carbon footprint I have to deal with and, my, and increase energy costs. So I'm going to put those hoop houses in the city or, or really close to the city where I can send my labor force out to harvest every day. And it is every day that those greens are harvested and, and grow some other crops farther away. So when we talk about a food system and by people who really know what they're talking about, they better be talking about some rural production as well. Okay, so the vertical farm, and this is a, a conceptual farm that changed. It was much more, ooh, uh, kind of crazy in the beginning. And now it is, um, I mean, it's, it's five stories. It has warehousing, it has a, a kitchen, community kitchen component. It has a um, nutrition cooking theater. Um, it's, it, it's not, it's occupying the same footprint that we've always used, you know, minus the, the buildings, the, the houses that were formerly here and really kind of uses sort of the, the window facade and kind of shearing the, 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 the facade to be able to grow food. So it's a, it's a pretty simple design. It's very doable. It's not over the top. And, you know, and for us, because of what we do, 
I mean, it's still probably like we don't have to have a facility like this, but it makes sense for us to have a facility because we train thousands of people every year. So um, we've really <laughs> outgrown having, for me, teaching project planning in Greenhouse One. <laughs> but people are going through and like watering microgreens. Really hard to, to do like a critique in that kind of environment. And that will be really a great way. We'll learn a lot about um, how feasible it is to do this um, once the structure is up. So a big part of our community outreach and how we engage folks that we partner with, but also just kind of keeping our do doors open, open so folks can learn to innovate is through weekend workshops. And they're a pretty, pretty small investment. Our, our prices are very reasonable. We always have scholarships. So they're available for anyone who wants to kind of try on some of these things and, and do some hands-on intensive. This is somebody from, um, uh, from my project planning class. So everything from learning how to, how to do microgreens, being able to um, you know, share meals together, um, you know, working on compost, literally you know, getting a shovel into the soil and, and you know, learning how to do that component of the work, beekeeping, you know, being able to go through the facilities and see all this like vertical space where we have these hanging baskets where we're growing greens as well. And I think just for, you know, in the context of social justice and the ability for folks to work together, I mean, when people come to most conferences or you're learning, like, you know, it's like I'm here telling you things and you're there <laughs> taking information in. These, these workshops are very integrated and multidisciplinary and multi-generational. And folks really get to learn, learn, learn about how, what it's like to work with people that are different than who they typically work with. And we talk about that. We're, we're very um, uh, purposeful about how we, um, how we set up our, our trainings. Um, we also run a commercial urban agriculture training program, or we call it CUA. It's something that um, I manage. And it's a five-month program. And it's really designed for folks who have an, who want to transition like their community garden or their urban ag idea from just sort of something that's there to actually being a viable business. Um, we have everyone from folks who have developed, this is Mark, Mark Lilly who um, developed a, a farm bus, he's out, in, out of Richmond, to folks from Oneida Reservation who are trying to figure out how to develop a you know, sustainable food, food system business. You know, just you know, young folks who are just like, hey, I want to be a farmer. I want to grow food in the city. So the five-month program is set up to really walk people through a business planning process. So folks go through from project planning, envisioning, to solidifying what their operation is going to be, to developing a marketing plan, developing all their um, financials, figuring out land, figuring out the um, uh, if there's any policy issues with where they're trying to set up their farm operation, um, figuring out labor. And of course, um, addressing um, social justice. So within that, you know, from start to finish, in the end of the five months, folks are presenting their business plan to the community. And our objective is that they go back and start their, their open their operations. One of the most successful is a, um, and this guy was a lot of fun to work with. <laughs> Um, out of DC, you know, he's a good friend now, but he was really hard, he was real hard to train. Um, and the training is very much, I mean, I, I use a lot of my um, art therapy um, training and resources. Um, he, he was very dubious, he wanted the handbook, he wanted to know how, how we do things and let me see your financials and explain to me, you know, I was very like, you know, I had that kind of um, energy and so it was, you know, and I, I was like, that's, what we do is what we do. What are you doing? You know, I had a really, it was, it was a challenge for me. But he had an aha moment. moment. He was always into efficiencies. We're really, he, he was very critical about how inefficient we are as an organization. And, um, and you know, and, and, and in some ways he's right, but a lot of our inefficiencies are part of our social justice work. It's why we are not-for-profit. It's part of our relationship building. But he came up with, on a compost pickup run, he came up with this idea of the compost cat. So he's built this business where he charges folks to pick up compost. So he gives you a cute little pail, comes to your house, swaps it out, weighs it, and it goes to you know, a community um, urban ag project in the, in the DC area. So he's got a few larger contracts. And he's been able to like, build a pretty, 
pretty like successful business and is now looking to replicate and kind of franchise it. But just to give you an idea of sort of the, the, the scope of the folks who are coming through growing power. Now through that, um, and then just, the, just our work over the last decade, me specifically, I mean, I, I did a lot of um, outreach work with my father. We'd go and we'd do trainings and we'd set up vermicompost systems and aquaponic systems and hoop houses and we'd come back a year later and there'd be nothing there. <laughs> and it'd be just so de just totally depressing. And all compelling reasons why limited resource communities are very challenging to work with. There's always some kind of pressure or something happening. So uh, my dad designed this, um, this new ROTC structure where folks have a five-year commitment working with us. We come in once a year, do kind of collabor collaboratively do a training, and, um, and then we also provide technical assistance while we're doing the training so that we're able to tweak your system, you know, kind of give you your, ne your, your next kind of um, evolution, things that you need to work on over the next year. And it really allows that organization or community group or, or individual entity to have the training wheels on a little longer. And it's just some accountability. You know, when you, you, know, you start shaking your boots a little bit when <laughs> Will Allen's come into your little operation and you let all your worms die. So the idea is that you will actually be more accountable. And it's a little bit paternalistic, but it's really, it's, it's and it still, still doesn't really work fully. We have all kinds of people at all different levels of progress, but it was really, you know, something that we felt very, very strongly about instituting because we were, you know, we don't do things for free. You know, somebody's paying us to come and do something. And we have to be accountable to our funders, you know, or for the, the public, because a lot of our funding um, to do that technical assistant work comes from the federal government. So, you know, so th those are things that, you know, we've evolved. And I think it's an important within this kind of work to be very responsive, you know. It doesn't, social justice doesn't mean like, oh, that's okay, we can start over again. No, like there's, you know, that's not okay. And, and there has to be some accountability. Um, so that's, that's been a big part of, um, of our journey and our evolution as an organization as well. So these are some of the partners um, who are in different states of, um, of being active and successful. And just a few that I'll just highlight. Brooklyn Rescue Mission, we, it was like 115 degrees when, when this lovely installation occurred. It was literally like one of the hottest days in New York. Um, so we put in an aquaponic system, put a hoop house up in a weekend. And people from the community came out and helped do that work, um, hands-on training, and really situating um, Brooklyn Rescue as the place to go to receive training, to get worms from, to be sort of the mini growing power within that community. Um, D-Town Farms, so the, De Detroit Black community, commu the Detroit Black Food Community Food Security Network, which I don't think is written there correctly. <laughs> um, but uh, many of you may know Malik Yakini, Monica White, just some luminaries within the food justice world. We've been working with D-Town for probably six years in developing their operation. Um, Fort Valley State, so working with Fort Valley to, um, to support their expansion to um, urban ag and community food systems, um, including some working with them on their aquaponics systems. Mega, Mississippians engaged in greener um, agriculture. This is in Shelby or in Mount Bayou, and this is actually the, um, where um, the jig that we use to bend all of our um, hoops was designed by this gentleman right here, Mr. Cornelius. Uh, our school at Blair Grocery in New Orleans in the Ninth Ward continues to be a very challenging project. Um, part of the issue with this project that was challenging is um, the leader of the project is from New York, <laughs> from New Orleans, um, and, um, and didn't have a farming background. So he had to really kind of go from through sort of a celebrity trans transformation where he was out speaking and going to conferences and really talking about his work much more so than doing the farming. You know, and I think that's one of the things that you know, like you really have to have, like I'm able to be here because I have 15 people in Chicago, plus, you know, a couple handfuls of interns and, you know, 60, 60 to 100 young people working on all of, our, all of our sites. You know, same with my father. Like you can't just, you can't leave, there's no farmer who can leave their farm operation and go, you know, do, doing whatever. So this is a big learning curve, but it was a really great learning curve because he's now buckled down and is really learning how to be a farmer. 
and there's some infrastructure that, that's in place, and when he needs assistance, he reaches out to us. Riddall Green Partnership, same, same kind of scenario, um, just really motivated group, um, family, fam you know, kind of a lot of cousins and family, um, interdisciplinary, a lot of artists. I mean, they were able to get this, this site allocated and have really been moving quickly in developing, kind of anchoring the community end of Cleveland's urban ag district. Seventh Harvest in Forest City, Arkansas. So, you know, more work in the, the um, Delta. The Women's Environmental Institute in uh, Minnesota. They also work in the Twin Cities. So that's been a great partnership. So those are just kind of give you an idea of sort of like, because we have this core, we've been able to branch out and support other communities in, in, in doing their work and developing their system. We learn a lot, there's a feedback loop. We learn a lot from the successes and failures of those partners and it just builds a stronger web of learning. So I think it's really important the relationships and being able to empower like, you know, in a conventional competitive, you know, sort of environment, you don't give away your secrets, right? Like you hold on to them, like that's what gives you the competitive edge and all of that kind of, um, that kind of culture. Within this kind of culture, we want to, we want to inspire and, and raise the bar in our work collectively. So when somebody who's connected to us has a failure, that is not good. You know, that I, I want I want folks to thrive. I want people to, to to outdo us because that means that there's more food security. That means that there's more folks able to really um, lead this work within within their community. I, I became a, a commissioner of the Chicago Park District, which is kind of awesome because what that allows me to do is to seriously think about land. So I'm really interested in. Well, you can't really farm without land, and most people who don't have a lot of money don't have land, um, which is why they don't have a lot of money, usually. Um, and so th there's an opportunity with how things are happening with real estate. There's lots of open land in Chicago and other places. We've heard a lot about Detroit, although I think Detroit's a special, it's a whole, it's its, its own thing, so I'm not, I am not gonna apply my strategy that I'm using in Chicago for Detroit, because I think it's a, a d different, a little bit of a different beast. Now, I would encourage others to not to, to do the same because I, I, it's a very, that is just kind of an exceptional, may become more, you know, we might have more Detroits, but I think the planning around how to, how to create a sustainable new economy there is gonna be different than cities that, like Chicago, like Milwaukee, um, like, you know, the Twin Cities. Um, I'm really interested in using, the Chicago Park District has a tax levy so there's some resources that are, you know, public, your taxes, the, you know, a certain amount that goes to the park district. Um, after all said and done, there's about 39 to, it's like $39 million of discretionary funds <laughs> that are, you know, projects get funded every year. And, um, you know, and I, I'm gonna be pushing to, first of all, come up with a strategy around urban farm, farmland preservation, and I'm literally calling it that, you know, being able to reclaim and, and allocate public land that'll be used in perpetuity for food production. Um, I believe in the commons. I, I don't think people need to own the land. I think that creates a lot of, that, you know, whoever owns the land is gonna abuse power. You know, you can own the structure, you can own the fertility that you're putting in, you can have equity in that land, but to own the land, especially when you're talking about a basic human right, I, I find it be problematic. <clears throat> so I really wanna set a precedent to have urban ag lands be held in trust either through the park district or through community land trust to be used in perpetuity for food production. And to, and to use, um, oh, here, let me go back. And to use um, public monies to help support and subsidize that, that development. So that's the big, that's gonna be my big commission project. And it's pretty much like as a commissioner, which I've, took me a year to figure out, I can be like, I really want us to do this. And then it, it, people have to work on it. So it's apparently a lot of power, and we're the world's largest park district. So, um, and, so and then there's other relationships with Forest Preserve. There's, there's just a lot going on with that. It's an unpaid civic. It's a politically appointed position. So, so I'm thinking really deeply about that, and um, I'm gonna, and I'll share the results of that with folks. If anyone's interested, you can reach out to me. So our youth court, we started in Milwaukee based on working with youth. And Chicago has really, really been the core and continues to be the core of our work. 
So we have a year-round um, food literacy cu uh, curriculum, you know, from harvest and consumption, processing, distrib distribution, and marketing, and growing, uh, growing and production. So kids learn pretty early on when they come to the gardens that you know working is, is a lot of hard work. Um, we we really try to turn over the production and the management of these sites pretty quickly to the, the kids that we're working with. Um, you know, after they, they get through Youth Corps, they graduate from high school, they do an internship, then, you know, many of our staff have been hired through that process. Um, this one young man here in the background, I think I have a couple other pictures of him, he actually texted me this morning, or actually just, I want to say this morning, it happened, this, ha happened a year ago, um, early morning. He was shot last, last year twice in the head. He still has both bullets in his head. So, and he, you know, texted me to thank me. So the, the reality of the youth that we work with is it's life or death. It's not some, you know, hypothetical or um, blight or, you know, slow food or not slow food. I mean, this is life and death. And this work is, for a lot of our kids, is life and death. So he was able to, like, miraculously survive that and, you know, work the farmer's market, the Green City Market this morning, and continues to um, excel and, and move forward as a young man. <clears throat> he also started working with us when he was 10. So he's been, he's um, been with me since I opened the office. So, you know, he's, he just turned 20. So just to give you an idea of the, the extent of how long and how deeply we work with, with youth. So on a micro scale, but then also, we, you know, last year we, we worked with 560 kids and employed them all in the food system, just in Chicago. So just changing sort of not only the kids' relationship with food and their literacy around where food comes from and the, and, you know, the economic opportunities, but their relationship with each other. So um, that is a big part of the work. So we do a lot of theater of the oppressed. We do a lot of um, team building games, you know, um, uh, roses and thorns. So an opportunity for folks to share, you know, things that they liked about the work day that day, you know, things they didn't like in really constructive, open ways. So just really doing a lot of that healing work. <clears throat> and just, you know, collective work, you know, some of these basic principles, being able to go into a garden and you know, work together on harvesting beans and then being able to see that people want to buy those beans and then I can take those beans home and, and, and cook them and have that full experiential um, opportunity within a summer, a summer um, job experience. But I think most importantly that they see the value, they see how other people value it and then they begin to value it in a really deep way. And these are not little rinky-dink sites. These are big sites. They're important places in the city. They're, you know, they're highly visible. So I think the scale, not only in the context of like just the, the economics of making it cash flow and making it sustainable, but also in the scale of transformation. If you want to make big changes, it has to be, it can't be a little rinky-dink, four or five little wood boxes and, you know, that's not, you can't really do anything with that. And, 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 and I say that as a challenge to maybe some of you who have some of those projects. <laughs> Hey, please expand them. You know, we, we pass that kind of, you know, you can't grow enough food in that or even make it that beautiful. It's an opportunity to really, I think, step up, step it up so that there's enough food that if there is thinking in that emergency, you know, kind of perspective, if something happened, could the, the project, the garden that you support or manage, could it, could it feed people? Could it feed the, the few houses around that project? Is that, would that be possible? So the culinary component is really important. So not only like how to grow the food, but seeing like uh, seeing peers also you know enjoy and prepare this food in delicious ways. This is a hip hop artist who raps about kale. <laughs> he's awesome. <laughs> he really take his name down. He's awesome, and he's just too cool. He's just a, he's just a cool brother, and he you know and he makes smoothies and you know gets gets kids really seeing this the the kind of hit factor of the food system from a cultural perspective. Reading, so the literacy piece, literally doing art, doing masks, inside-outside masks, so these are like face casts, 
and just you know having an opportunity to like just to do some reflection work about who we are and and to be able to have the space to do that while also you know doing hard work so kind of a big part of like you know y'all everyone develops their projects or you know your research or whatever it is that you do that you're passionate about based on your own experiences so for me it's always been hard work i was bragging about it last night i can outwork all my peoples literally like it'll take it takes me two hours takes other people two three days to do on the farm and that's just because of how i grew up and just the amount of work that we did so being able to pass it on, I don't want anyone to have to work as hard as I did, and I certainly don't want anyone to have to work as hard as my father did. But to have some sort of space where folks are really motivated to get the hustle on, to be able to also have space to be creative and reflective and um, to read and write about the things that they're accomplishing. So this just gives you a snapshot of the breadth of the work that we do <clears throat> and our staff. So Chicago Lights Urban Farm, this farm is in Cabrini Green. Um, this is on, this is the first one we did on asphalt. This is former basketball and tennis courts. We just brought in our compost, built beds. Um, this is, we now have two hoop houses and a um, fully operational greenhouse with heat and all the bells and whistles. And it's a very, very productive, beautiful space. I also transitioned from being sort of a hybrid community garden space to being a fully functional farm that's run by youth who are employed in the summer. It still has a small um, community garden component for folks who live just within the immediate vicinity, but really is, it's focused on um, supporting the youth from the community, I love this picture, um, to be able to learn how to grow food and to be employed on the site. There's a farm stand, so um, during the summer, the farm stand is open every day. Um, this is a, a big, this is like, you know, my special project. It's in Grant Park, and it really allowed me to kind of um, merge my, um, my art degree and my, I went to the, the Art Institute, so like, so literally like down the street, and being able to, to solve the problem of, first of all, it's eight years old, so I've been farming on public land for eight years. Um, it's been a space for our youth to come and learn how to grow food. Um, it had to be beautiful, it had, had to be culturally, um, relevant to people walking through, so food from all over the world, and somewhat financially um, uh, sustainable. Um, for us, it's been very financially sustainable because we got paid by the landscape contractor to manage the space. So just a great model of like, instead of growing petunias with, you know, park district and like city money, why not pay a not profit to put a farm in and maintain it and hire youth and create this dynamic? And it's public land. So this sort of like began the whole kind of thinking around public land and being able to use it in perpetuity for farming. And it's a potager, it has a French design. Those are spirals. This is lots of fun. This, it's a, and it's huge. It's about the growing, the surface growing um, area is about 24,000 square feet. The whole space is probably two acres. So youth have been able to come down and harvest and you know, plant and be part of this magnificent space. So I'm also a big lover of, the, of how important these spaces are, that they're beautiful and seductive and they re-enchant people around food and farming. Um, there's nothing more beautiful to me than a farm that's well managed, you know, that is being actively used and well, you know, people who are running it know what they're doing and that um, when people see it, they get hungry and they get inspired and they want to become farmers. And that's the experience that a lot of our youth have had working in the space with folks in suits walking by and expressing that. And it's been a, a powerful motivating um, force for them in their lives. <clears throat> Last year we started a new farm on the other side. This is Congress in Columbus. If any of you have been to Chicago, um, where the Buckingham Fountain is, it's right, there's a Congress hits Columbus right at the Buckingham Fountain. So the, the vegetable garden is on the north side of Congress, so it's called North President's Court. So with the big inauguration night, or not an not election night, that's where all the celebration happened. One of my beds got trampled. And on the south is called South President's Court. And that's where we just, we, last year, last spring, we installed a uh, fragrance garden. 
So we're growing um, roses, lavender, patchouli. We tried to release last year, but rabbits ate them up. And uh, rose scented geranium for a local, um, for a perfume from, from these botanicals. And just another design challenge to, um, you know, to set that space up. Oakville Gardens Community Farm is a project that started in 2010, and it was um, funded through Workforce Recovery Act funds. 11th hour, we got a call from Chicago Housing Authority. Could we create a farm? It's like Mission Impossible. Can you create a farm that will employ 100 and it's a crazy amount of people, like 150 adults and 40 youth in five weeks? And my response was, maybe if you, you have to find me at least two acres of land. And they found me two and a half. So we started, um, and this, this, I had been warned at the beginning of, of my shift into food systems work to never work in this community. It's in a really um, challenging part of the city. It's literally, it's in this toxic donut. So it's surrounded by the dump, the incinerators, like all kinds of heavy industry. But there's 2,000 black people who live in this community surrounded by this like environmental toxins. So again, my emergency services Sensibility is like, what would happen to these 2,000 people who live in this space? Like, literally, what would happen? And, you know, as somebody who's doing this work, what is my responsibility? So my responsibility is to ante up, <laughs> put together some crazy budgets, and get to crack it up <laughs> a farm, a pretty toxic site, but it's where people live. I mean, the, the site is, isn't a brownfield or anything. It's just the whole environment is toxic, but people are living there, and to create, you know, some food security. So we did, and it was really hard. This is all clay that we put down first. We do two, two feet of wood chips, kind of as EPA brags now. Clay, two, you know, two feet of wood chips, and then we bring in our biomass. And you know, the biomass, you know, I think it's really important to understand soil management in, in contaminated spaces. It's not like you do it once and you're done. You constantly have to feed the soil. You constantly have to, to keep that fertility up, both for, for production, but also to keep the roots keep the plant material in that, in that, um, that material. You don't want it going and looking for roots to go look for stuff if there's not enough nutrition. So you want them to stay there and, um, and be nourished by um, all the energy that's in that, in that material. So there's a lot of clay, we built boxes, and you know, this is uh, actually an image from the second year. You know, we started getting some pretty serious harvests. So this is from last year, you know, putting, um, we just use, we don't use row cover because it's too expensive and it doesn't make that much of a difference. Um, covering up all the, all the crops, collard greens, winter, and this is from this, this uh, season. Sorry about the picture quality. We did some art and we also um, integrated a active transportation component. So all 130 kids who worked in this site this summer learned how to ride bikes. We learned how to do ma basic maintenance and do community bike rides. So it was the first time a lot of the kids had ever been like on like a full-on bike ride in their own community. And you know, just the, the farming, the farming component of this site also has developed heavily over this last three years, this being the third season. Um, kids got certificates this summer of completion. Roosevelt Square also started in 2010, same dynamic. Um, this is an aerial shot. Those are all piles of wood chips over here that we spread and covered. This was a, a swimming pool at, some, at one point, and they fill it up with cement. So we brought in um, compost, a shed, and started growing immediately. That's a senior center in the background. Um, when these kids set up their farm stand, they sell out. People drive by like, <laughs> it's kind of hilarious. Kids are very active with selling, but they sell a lot of produce. And for the first two years, there, there, was, there wasn't any, um, there was no fence. So the seniors would come over and harvest and it wasn't, you know, it wasn't a lot of, you know, security around, around uh, maintaining the, the produce just for sales. And even, that, you know, now with the fence, those same seniors come and they buy the produce. So it's, it's a pretty amazing um, collaboration. And they, you know, can just see how much food is being grown. And eventually, every square inch of this site will be covered with food. So we just, we slowly, you know, add, add more and more beds every season and keep expanding the production. This is all managed by these kids. This is a new project, and this kind of 
This project started be prior to me becoming a commissioner, but it's, um, it's, right, it's on the southeast side of Chicago. It's right next to a former U.S. Steel site, and um, it's about 17 acres, seven of which will be um, an urban farm park. The other 10 acres will be passive green space use with a walking path. It emerged out of a um, Kellogg-funded um, food and fitness collaborative um, for Chicago. We, we didn't run a warrior, one of the big um, food and fitness um, brands. But we got kind of a, a little bit of funding to come together to think about how to integrate um, food and fitness. And so one of the things that came out was, why can't we have these public spaces where people can come, community food center again, like learn how to grow, process, consume, healthy local food, and also have spaces to have active transportation and physical activity. So the one half, well, seven acres will be used for allotments, so about an acre of allotments, so it'll be larger allotments. And then um, probably like two acres for this new program I'll talk about in a, a moment as well called Farmers for Chicago, where folks will get larger, like quarter acre to a half acre parcels that um, they will be able to use in perpetuity as long as they're maintaining organic standards and all that kind of good stuff to be able to grow um, their farm businesses to then our production, which will be the remaining four, four acres or so with hoop houses and just intense production you know, employment and being able to provide food security. Um, and that, that emerged as well from the Jackson Park Urban Farms. This was another, just another model of being able to use public land, half the space we've used for our own production, and the other half we support allotments. So it's a way that the park district doesn't have to pay anybody to manage the site. We provide technical assistance to community gardeners. We, we you know, assign everyone a plot. We provide a few little workshops during the season, and in exchange, we're able to use some of the land. So this is a great model that the Park District has adopted for other groups to be able to, to um, have farms in public, on public land. And it's a way like, you know, before, I, I'm a firm believer that community gardens need to be staffed, either by somebody who's volunteering their time and is really making a commitment to be there when they first start, to really make sure that the community is anchored in um, knowing that there's going to be consistent support. Educare, so Ounce of Prevention Garden, and so this is a little garden that we put in um, right behind a, um, uh, basically a head start, and it's just in its second year and it's been profoundly impactful. So you have little, I mean, even like babies, they bring the babies out just to like see the garden. So um, they come out and they, throughout the whole season, and each class, was 13 classes, they all ro through, rotate through once a week and um, you know, have different little sensory lessons. And this is gonna expand into, and then evening parent, when parents come, once a week there's like a open garden where people can come and harvest and learn about the farm and, and volunteer. Next year that'll be expanded even more. So Beloved Community Garden, which is a project that, um, it worked well, but it was, there's a lot of internalized oppression within the organization that, um, that runs, it, runs the project but it was literally like a garden that we installed within three days. So this is the same season. It was just a grassy infill lot. We put wood chip down, brought in compost, seeded it, and it was incredibly, incredibly productive um, its first season. Iron Street Farm, so this is, um, this is where I'm headquartered for our operations. So for years we didn't have a headquarters. We had no, I had like a, like a church basement office and like a closet address or something. <laughs> Another point I met overhead was very low, and it was all project-based. And that was by design, but also because it was so hard for us to get land. And, um, and so we were able to basically graduate into um, having a facility. We don't own it. <clears throat> we probably won't um, stay at this site for our full operations. We'll probably continue composting there as long as we can. Um, but this has been um, a really important project to be able to take a former um, truck depot in a pretty industrial area. Um, it's on the Chicago River and transform it within three years into a very, very productive farm space. It's also, these are some, you know, some of the kind of design elements and um, this is what it looked like when we first started. And you can see like this is like uh, this 22,000 square feet interior that we're using. Um, so 11,000 upstairs, 11,000 downstairs. Those are all the dock, the dock bays. We did a mural the first year and just cleaned the site up. There was lots of tires and just debris that had been dumped there. 
We built the worm bins. We worked with our youth corps and staff to spread wood chip all over the concrete. You know, we had volunteer groups come in and help build our hoop houses. You can see how quickly we've been able to develop this space. I also put in a clay berm because I was just concerned about like, uh, you know, this whatever worm tea getting into the nasty Chicago River. But I, I wanted just to create an ecological berm so that in case there was any issues, um, that it was there. Oops. <clears throat> and this is this is a shot I took um, in June, so you can see we've developed. This is the back part. That this greenhouse here, our hoop house, you can see that big mound in there. That's compost. That's our in vessel compost operation. So you can't do windrow composting in the city, but you can do it in vessel. So that's my way of getting around some crazy rules. And it's also very it keeps the smell down. It's so hot, it breaks the waste down really quickly. You can just see how quickly we've been able to transform the space, including the debris that was there. The vermicompost operation inside. Vertical production, just really simple um, vertical growing systems. So all that possible because of compost. So we divert lots of waste. It comes in all kinds of um, trucks. People bring it. We pick it up. We go pick up brewery mash, which is really the secret ingredient. It has so much energy, and the worms love it. <clears throat> they love bananas, too. This is um, it's a bunch of finished compost that was finished within these um, palleted cubes. Everyone has pallets. You frame them, or you line them with hardware cloth and which is just basically metal so that um, rats don't uh, get all up in your compost and they because they will and they're gross so and we're, and we're doing this work on in milwaukee and in chicago on rivers so you know there's even more rats i cannot stress enough before you start get your pest management plan together and we have a, a really intense one we have a, an excellent like a, a, a pro in managing pests and so we don't have a rodent problem but we have not. So you don't have, you, there's no such thing as a rat-free operation anywhere. I don't want to lie to you. But you can have them managed, and you want them managed. So you can just see, like, you know, this is compost, like, in a residential, you know. Um, so vermicompost, when the first lady visited us in Iron Street. Um, vermicompost, so you have your compost. You can't do vermicompost without compost. you got to have that food to feed the worms. Worms have no teeth, has to be soft and broken down. So those of you who do your little worm, you have a little worm farm under your sink, you gotta pre-break down the food you feed them. They, they sit there and wait until that stuff gets soft because they have no teeth. So the idea of having a really productive um, vermicompost system, you have to have the ability to, to create compost then feed your worms. They also eat their weight daily. I had a major loss this spring because I had a staff person who I had to unfortunately let go who hadn't been maintaining, um, managing the worm bins, and a lot of our worms starved to death. Because once you reach a certain population, they're eating 20, 30 pounds of food a day because they eat their weight daily, literally. So if you don't have and you haven't screened them and, and pulled them out of their waste and giving them a new food habitat, they, they starve to death and then they just disappear because they're they're just like, they're nothing. I mean, they're pretty amazing. Cause they, they're so, without really any kind of <laughs> makeup, they slide through window screen. That's how we harvest them. We put food on top of window screen, which is what you're seeing in this image, and they crawl through the window screen to get to the food. So, you know, and th that's that kind of like, that many worms, that's how many worms are in the systems. So. You know, that was pretty devastating, but it really was a big wake-up call for our staff to, like, this is not just, you know, playtime. This is serious, and without that fertility, I mean, we use, like, you know, tons and tons of this worm, worm castings for all of our, our production. You know, it's not just a product to sell. We use it. That is our fertility. And that's Malcolm when he was a little baby. So year-round growing, I mean, literally, we're growing greens in these just simple hoop houses, you know, little, just little, you know, little uh, bendable wire and then old greenhouse plastic. 
and we're growing this food all through the winter. And we used to do these piles in the four corners of compost to create more biomass. What we, what we do now is we rebuild the beds for the winter and we build them up really high. So the biomass is just literally with, with, um, with the bed. So we don't have to do that anymore. So just learning construction, being able to, to, do, to do all this stuff is something that's part of, of our system. And being able to pass on all these different pieces to the folks that we work with. So aquaponics, you know, again, if you can't do compost, please don't start with aquaponics. You know, <laughs> can't manage, if you can't manage to get it together to do compost or vermicompost, don't get into the aquaponics business, please. Because it's, it's, it, it is a little more pricey. We can do it a little on the cheap, but it's just sophisticated and it's a dedication and you have to be able to really manage a farm operation to do this well. But we will teach you how to do it <laughs> in a weekend workshop. You can learn um, in these simple two-tier systems where you know the the fish are in the bottom, and then the the beds on like fish are down here, so pebble and watercress are on the top. Sometimes there's pots. There's not watercress. There's the pots of greens growing, and all the pots are anchored with um, our compost. So there's a symbiotic relationship between the water, the micronutrients and organisms that are leaching into the water and the fish and vice versa. Hungry tilapia. And it, you know, again, multi-generational workshops, folks put up one of these systems in a, in a weekend. Mushrooms, someone brought mushrooms to us. We now have some pink oysters. There are mushrooms in these chandeliers, so another form of low-tech vertical production. And it's a way just to maximize every square inch of space. So those are some um, pohu, gray dove, and, and um, pink oysters. You know, we've experimented, but they love the greenhouses, they love hot and humid, and so, you know, we can just inoculate the straw and grow them underneath the benches. So really the idea is to have food growing everywhere. Shiitake mushroom logs suspended over um, aqua, aquaponics tanks. Beekeeping, this is our beekeeping operation in Chicago. Milwaukee. Microgreens, and microgreens, we make a lot of money on microgreens. It's also a great food security um, product. You can grow a sunflower sprout from start to finish in seven days, and they're about 39% protein. So the sprout of the sunflower has more protein in it than the seed does. So it's just a really highly nutritious food, great emergency food. And, it, and then we sell it for $12 a pound. We sell lots of it. So and this is the, the basic um, mix that we use, coir castings and um, worm castings and the coyers for as a sustainable like a peat moss made out of coconut fiber. And it, you know, and it's shipped in from Sri Lanka, somewhere far away, but it's shipped in, in a, on a, like a freighter on, in these huge volumes, so the um, carbon footprint is, is pretty minimal in comparison to, um, you know, the amount of water that's saved because it, it holds water really well and that we're not cutting up bogs for peat moss. So, you know, again, diversification. We do some livestock, we've got these chickens, we've got the goats, and we're starting to breed um, billies. Um, we have a, a special kind of, uh, I, I'm not a real livestock person. I just say hi to them. I don't really know that much about, about them, but we have a special um, South African boar type of goat. They're beautiful, and so um, we're trying to really create um, a, uh, a compact urban um, herd. So we're pretty far along with that now, too. And our goats are super healthy. They eat really well. Renewable energy, so solar panels, anaerobic digestion. This is, this is a system that we've tested. It's not operational yet. This is a big part of the work that I'm doing in Chicago is trying to get a digester, 100, 100 ton a day digester system set up. Um, we have a stormwater collection project that collects all the stormwater from all the greenhouses that we use in our operation. 
did um, MMSD, Milwaukee Metropolitan um, Sewage District, supported. And we even like used the, you know, used the top part to put bedding plants on in the spring. So the active transportation I talked about a little bit. Um, we got a lot of bikes donated and, you know, at all three um, big youth sites this summer, kids learned how to do bike repairs, how to ride, and, um, you know, just be able to, like, feel a lot more confident on, um, on the bike. Farmers markets, we do the Green City Market, which is kind of a groundbreaking farmers market in Chicago. All the vendors have to be either, you know, sustainable or organic now. Um, it's a tremendous, it's been a tremendous um, economic opportunity for us. We sell to a lot of um, chefs, a lot of restaurants, have established a lot of accounts um, from this market. And it really allows us to have more affordable prices at our other markets because we're able to charge, you know, um, a, a higher price at this market. We have a farm stand on site at Iron Street. at Alga Gardens, and also um, we do a lot of um, food tastings there as well. The Chicago Lights, the farm I um, talked about earlier that's, that was built on asphalt, and the youth run that, that farm stand, Roosevelt Square. And then we, we establish this thing called a market club. So, the Market Club is really, um, it's a way to kind of get people to commit to buying from the farm um, without having to make the full pre-season heavy financial commitment. So you pay $25, you it holds your slot at that farm stand, which allows you to come to the farm stand every week and get $20 worth of product. So you, all you're making is a $25 investment as a consumer. You may never come. You've at least you give me $25, thank you very much. And, you know, and then it, or you, you come one week, you don't have to come the next week, you're not like set to absolutely have to go. So it's kind of a riff on our market basket program, but it's a way to get a little startup capital and a sort of guarantee at like a, a farm stand that's on your farm that you have some folks coming through. So that helps with your labor and that you're, you're, you're having cash flow at all your, at all your sites. So we, it did pretty well. Like we, what, what we've learned is that we have to do, we have to really remind people that they should come buy food. So, and every time we did that, we, like we, our numbers would go up. We had about 40 people who subscribed. So, you know, that was, that was a nice chunk of money that we, we wouldn't have gotten normally, right? And, and folks, like, there's that much interest. And we didn't do a big push on marketing it as well. Some of the restaurants we sell to. And just diversifying, you know, the kind of food that we grow, you know, high market value crops, edible flowers. We have a cafe and food market in Milwaukee, the Market Basket Program, which has been kind of our, our uh, it's very similar to Food Chairs, a good food basket. They were developed around the same time. And it's a mix of conventional and food that we grow and then food from our, um, our uh, farmers co-op. So it's really just a way for folks in the community to get consistent, healthy food that you get at, a, at your farmer's market, but you get it in a bag and you can order it on and off depending on when you want it. Every week, every other week, there's no commitment like, like you have with a conventional CSA. You get, I mean, you get all this food for $9. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. You know, and, and it's, there's always some fruit, there's always citrus, there's always, usually always bananas, and you know, and, and, you know, a lot of folks, like we have folks on the like, on the more privileged end, are like, why do you have bananas and oranges? It's not local. Yeah, but people in the community who don't have access to those things want those things. And so that's, you know, and, and you can get it too, because I get, bet you, you go and buy bananas and oranges somewhere. So just kind of shifting the dynamic around what it looks like to have um, access to good, healthy food. And then we do also do a sustainable basket, which is all organic certified, all local, um, produce as well, I mean, it's, but it's more expensive. Our, our eventual goal is to have one product that's the same price, but we're not. We haven't rebuilt the food system. So this is just a day of all the produce coming in from Milwaukee and from all of our farms and getting situated to them because we actually use the, the warehouse, like the, our facility is kind of a little mini logistics center. So we're able to like have trucks back up and unload and then reload to go out and make deliveries. This is a new program that I've started. 
that's um, going to be a three-year new farmer incubation program. And this will, will allow folks to, who have a business plan, who want to farm in Chicago, to have access to land in perpetuity and to have some technical assistance support. Um, the first year is going to be really focused on folks coming from um, communities that are most impacted by food insecurity, but it will also be opened up to anyone who wants to pay tuition. And, um, and the great thing is that folks will have access to markets, access to capital, and have kind of this branding of being a part of the program. <clears throat> but for me, I mean, there was nothing, there was no program like that for me when I started, you know. And, you know, as a result, we've developed all these great, great projects and models, but I really, that wasn't my plan. My plan was to start farming, was to start, you know, creating food security. And I couldn't get there because there was no way for me to get land. So this is a way for folks who want to, who have the passion, who have a plan, to be able to start farming and to have access to that land, land in perpetuity and not be held up by not having the capital to purchase land, not having the political clout to know how to do that, et cetera. So that project will also have a, a, a tool share, you know, refrigeration. Um, we're gonna do, everyone ha has to have GAP certification because of some of the, the retail wholesale um, opportunities we have, which is just great, like, food safety training anyway, just stuff that people just need to be doing anyway if you're operating a farm business. So um, the GAP training, um, including like just once you get your fertility in place, you grow in your basic crops, beginning to do added value. So I'm, I'm a firm believer, I love added value. I do it all day long, it's super fun, your jams, your jellies, your this is and that's. But I need the people to grow the, the this is and that's first to go into those things. So, you know, we have plenty of bakeries and all kinds of little like specialty food people. We don't have enough folks coming up who want to just grow the food. So we're going to really focus first on the, getting the farm set up and then create the space where folks can also develop added value products. And it's a big part of our youth core, you know, just being able to take, you know, all the herbs that they grow to dry them just to have them um, package up tea to do an organic non-caffeinated tea from the farm, essential oils that are drawn out from, from a lot of the botanicals, bedding plants. Um, the Growing Food and Justice for All initiative I, sp I mentioned at the beginning, this is really the initiative that we use to, um, to really have a space for folks, for people of color and white allies to really strategize and figure out how to address racism and to really understand it. Um, through taking workshops together and trainings, but then having caucuses where folks can really talk about what their challenges are and, and, and come up with action plans to undo a lot of this stuff within their own projects, within their communities, institutions, et cetera. 